Every waking day is a reminder just how beautiful this, our land, truly is. The kind of beauty that you can only find here. In the lush green all around us and the wondrous sights within. It's what you feel in the gentle caress of tropical wind from the mountaintops. And the glow in your heart from a warm neighborly invite. It's in the distinct aroma of our cooking to the taste of food that takes you on a journey. In the sound of homecoming and the sound of Mother Earth. In the magnificence we find on our travels and the exciting moments we experience. Ours is the kind of beauty that comes in all things big and small. All we have to do is awaken our senses and truly enjoy what's uniquely ours. Investment uh, experts. We will have uh, a presentation from our own uh, National Planning Authority. We also have representation uh, from the Ministry of Finance here in Uganda and uh, the stakeholders, the other stakeholders that I will be introducing who are in this room and some of our panelists, of course, will be joining us uh, very shortly. But um, that said, allow me uh, invite uh, our panelists, the ones who are already here, to take their seats. So if uh, uh, Sam uh, and Samantha um, and uh, Sven can all take their seats at the front uh, before we get uh, all the others, then I'll introduce you when you're at the front. When the other panelists come, I'll also ask them to join you. Um, and so this morning, um, the speakers will be speaking to quite a range of um, subjects under investment. We are looking at... Uh, investor views on uh, opportunities and incentives here in Uganda. We are looking at the public sector uh, tourism investment incentives and of course what government is doing uh, to support uh, investment in the sector. We are also looking at uh, uh, another perspective from uh, a practitioner on uh, what incentives uh, are most attractive for somebody who would want to invest in the sector. Uh, we are also looking at the uh, a key stakeholder, the Ghana Wildlife Authority, is speaking about the investment protocols and opportunities in the wildlife conservation areas with a look into the pros for investing in areas under uh, the authority. We'll also be looking at the sustainable financing options for the tourism business value chain. So it's quite um, a handful for this morning, but we'll try and keep it within the time. I think um, we were meant to close at one. We may request for some time um, to complete the discussion and take as many, many uh, questions as possible. So let me introduce our panelists who are here uh, and have already joined us. Uh, Mr. Sam Mwanda, uh, but if you, depending on where you come from, you may call him Mwanda, uh, but uh, he's Mr. Sam Mwanda, the Executive Director of Uganda Wildlife Authority. He probably has the best and coolest job in this country. Um, he gets to visit all his parks for free. We don't. We can't. Um, but also pretends over probably the biggest chunk of land in this country. He's the biggest landlord um, in this country. And he's doing quite amazing things with uh, the Wildlife Authority. And year on year we keep seeing uh, a growth in the number of our animals. Um, I personally am very excited about what they've done in, in Western Uganda, in Lake Mburo National Park, where after the translocation of the giraffes, I think there were 16, I can't remember the first 16, 15, yes, now there are 
40, 47. Imagine, the first translocation was 15, there are now 47 giraffes uh, in, in that place, and it's so beautiful. Um, so uh, he will be speaking to us, of course, about the investment protocols in the conservation area. Uh, but also with us this morning is uh, Samantha Munda, co-founder and Group MD uh, Trianam Hospitality. We thank you, Samantha, for joining us. Uh, she'll be talking about the alternative business models, franchise versus management versus hotel lease. Uh, versus owner operation. Um, and I am one of those who's thinking, and I was telling uh, uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Birigwa here, that I want to join the sector in some, in some way. And so I think I will be more interested in some other's presentation on whether I need a franchise or I should do ownership or uh, I'll, I'll go the lease. Uh, but I'm glad um, we have this uh, panel here with us. Let me introduce uh, Sven. And Sven, I'll, I'll stay away from the other beautiful French name. I made by it myself. General Manager, Latitude Hotels Group, uh, Uganda. He has a beautiful facility uh, that has a great view um, in this country. And um, he will be looking at the incentives in the private sector, that uh, public sector that, you know, uh, attract people like him to invest uh, in the sector. That and much more. I really want to uh, listen in. Our other panelists, when they come, I'll introduce them. So allow me to begin uh, with Sam Wanda, uh, who's going to come uh, and run us through uh, the uh, protocols um, and how you can actually uh, be an investor within the conservation areas that he supervises and superintends over and what you need to do, what you need to look out for. I was just sharing with a colleague on one of the uh, strategic locations uh, in Lake Borough National Park and I discovered that uh, one of our members has the lease for that particular area. And so I was quite excited that somebody has already seen it as an opportunity for investment. And uh, they are already looking for partners to invest in that very strategic location at Lake Mbura that allows you to see, I think, about three lakes when you're right on that location. Uh, it allows you to see one of the dams that when the animals come, you're able to see as many animals um, from that particular location. And I, I, I kind of thought if anyone had a lodge and the rooms were overseeing that location, it's so beautiful. And I can't wait um, to be one of those that will benefit from staying there. So Sam, please come and uh, run us through a presentation. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Sam. And, and please note there are two Sams. There's Samantha and Sam. So even Samantha is called Sam in her other capacity. So as they, they said this up, let me recognize uh, the Honorable Dr. Christmas Chionga, who is here with us, comes from one of the most beautiful places in this country, Kasese. Uh, he's a former minister, but also uh, an area member of parliament, uh, former, member of area, former member of parliament in that area. And uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the Rezori. Uh, he was a very uh, key supporter of the Rezori Marathon last year. And we are going back this year on the 2nd of September. Um, again, uh, the marathon, we believe, is going to attract some of the uh, most interesting people who have been running uh, mountain marathons. And uh, we look forward to, I hope, I hope Honorable, you, you have created more accommodation for us, because we are coming uh, in big numbers. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Maris. Um, can I borrow the mic? Yeah, you want this? Yes. Before you start, can I invite the Minister of Finance, uh, Paul, you take the seat, so then I'll introduce you just on uh, the presentation. Yes. Thank you, Maris. Um, just wanted to have this mic that allows me to move around, uh, because I don't want to stay behind this pulpit throughout. Um, ladies and gentlemen, most welcome to our presentations this morning. I have a presentation, but I thought I would speak of calf. So you will see me saying things that are not on the screen. Forgive me. Um, first and foremost, I want to welcome you to our national parks, our wildlife reserves in Uganda. We have 10 national parks, we have uh, 12 wildlife reserves, we have some community wildlife areas, and all these are meant to protect wildlife. And uh, there are things you can do in these parks and reserves. You could see the animals, yes, but 
I think Uganda is more than just animals. And that's the beauty of uh, our country. Because we have a size of just above 236,000 square kilometers, including water, uh, literally in the center of Africa. Uh, we, we, if you are a foreigner here, you obviously know this is the pearl of Africa. The fact that it's a pearl is because it has many things uh, that is in this small space because it is a convergence of several climatic zones. And we have in this small little place that has 45 million Ugandans, uh, we have 56 tribes, people who speak different languages. There are some relationships because, for example, where I come from in the East, I can understand 100% of what the guys in the central here speak, but also probably 30% of what the people down south in Chigezi speak. What that means, therefore, is that we are really all related. Our climate is fantastic. We've had a lot of rain the last three days. And somebody might think, if you're... You are new in Uganda, and I think it rains cats and dogs every day. But that's not the issue. Uh, it happens like that for a while, and you've noticed that immediately it is warm. Uh, forget the cold temperature in this room. Uganda Health Authority is uh, an agency of government. We manage uh, the parks, as I've already mentioned. And we work very closely with many stakeholders, including the communities that neighbor these protected areas, but also with a lot of private sector players. And I'll be talking investment uh, shortly. Uh, most of the investments we have in the protected areas are actually privately owned. Uh, we have a few that we manage as Uganda Life Authority, but we've chosen that the services are better provided by the private sector. Um, how do we finance our operations? We, when you are visiting our national park, we will ask you to pay a little something at the gate. When you want an activity, uh, some of the activities we levy a fee. Uh, if you go for a game drive, for example, and you need a guide, we'll ask you a guiding fee. If you're going to use our boat on uh, our waters, we'll ask you to pay uh, the boat fee uh, that allows you to go on the water. And those fees are really reasonable compared to many in our region. And uh, for Ugandans, many of you fear to go to a national park. If you are Ugandan, if you are East African, you pay only 20,000 to enter Lake Mburo or Queen Elizabeth. Paul, am I right? 20,000 Uganda shillings. Surely you can afford that as a Ugandan. You can. And uh, if you are foreign, I will ask you for a little more. But still, if you compare with our colleagues around East Africa, we are the cheapest destination. And we use that money to do the activities uh, that we do to uh, run and maintain the facilities that we have, the roads, the boats, uh, the vehicles, and ensure that staff who currently number slightly over 3,000 are paid a salary and they can do the work that they are meant to do. Now, now previously we literally we were spending you know, collecting and spending 100% of what uh, we got and that was enough and government was uh, putting in little in terms of investment. Uh, when COVID came, we went to government and said, you know, we're also part of you. Can you give us some money? So for Ugandans, when I talk 51 billion, you will know that uh, we got quite a good chunk of money to help us run in the year 2021-22. This year, we are getting 38 billion. Um, 
next year it has been cut substantially but we are raising a lot more uh, given that now tourism is back on track so we, we, we think that probably after next financial year uh, we will not need government to give support we will be able to run our operations uh, seamlessly um, I don't want to bother you with that map but it shows the areas where uh, protected areas are you'll notice that more, most of them are at the borders with Kenya, with South Sudan with DR Congo, with Rwanda and um, our visitor numbers you might be interested still small because we haven't even reached half a million um, but you will notice that from 2018 from 325 we dropped to just about 100,000 because of COVID uh, but last year, calendar year we now surpassed the figures pre-COVID um, and for Ugandans who are still delaying to go and visit our figures pre-COVID were 50% East Africans and 50% foreigners now it is 63% East Africans and I can assure you over 90% are Ugandan and uh, the rest are the foreigners meaning therefore that these protected areas are yours as Ugandans and you should come and visit and enjoy uh, because some of the, the, the money that we are getting comes from you this is the same information I've shared in the table now in terms of investment why are we talking investment one we want to improve visitor experience through high quality tourism facilities being a government agency we are limited by resources we are also limited by ideas but if we bring in uh, private investment then we get more ideas we get more investment and the limitations are much less and therefore visit experience will be improved two we want to accommodate the increasing trend of visitor numbers the numbers are going up we need accommodation for them so that they are able uh, the visitors are able to actually uh, come visit make a choice of where they want to stay is it a camp is it a budget accommodation is it a mid-range is it high-end and for Uganda we still have challenges with what we call high-end I think they are not really high but our rates are still high so if we got more investment we should be able to bring down the costs of visitation to the protected areas and have more people but as we have more people those who have already invested we also have more and we'll be able to make uh, uh, make the profits that they need to make to continue uh, working and then we want to provide employment opportunities to our people and improve the livelihoods because one of the key things about Uganda Life Authority is that within our law that for, you know, creates the authority is a provision for 20% of entrance fees that go to communities so as more people come in as investments are made more people will come in and as more people come in we'll have additional resources 20 percent that we send and uh, share with the communities so that is important but also we will have jobs for these communities and then we want to generate revenue for national development um, Ugandans, you know the thing called VAT, and you know the other one called PAYE. Um, I just paid salaries for my staff, I think, yesterday. Uh, so, staff here, if you haven't seen your account being happy, please know. Now, our bill was 
three billion. That is the net. Now, when you calculate pay on that salary, I think it is somewhere around 500 million um, that is going to government. So we want to generate gov money and the uh, Kampalans are complaining potholes. Hopefully some of that will go and deal with the potholes we struggle with. We also want to attract credible investors who will raise the profile and visibility of our country. And uh, capital is always a challenge, so we want to uh, raise the capital uh, so that it facilitates Uganda to become a highly competitive um, country in terms of tourism investments. Those are some of the things that could be invested in and uh, quickly. Why should you, either as a Ugandan or an East African or somebody coming from Europe or China or wherever, why should you invest? Let me tell you that Uganda has a high biodiversity. You may not be able to see some of the wildlife but the variety my friend is nowhere to be equaled if you left kampala and you traveled uh, south what you will see there will be completely different if you traveled west and will be completely different if you traveled north because we have a high biodiversity we are confluence of several climate zones and therefore the biodiversity is high. Then we think that there are a range of market ready products that can be invested in accommodation, uh, venues, uh, actual tourism infrastructure. We talked about a pleasant weather throughout the year. Uh, if you've been here and you're a foreigner and you've been here for three, four days, this is the coldest Kampala becomes. It will rise and be about 25 and play around 25. When we get to the real dry times, it will go to 29. Very nice weather. And then we are strategically located, I showed you the map, in the heart of Africa. So you can go either direction very easily, east, west, north, south. And then we are part of the East African community, roughly 300 million people. That is big business. We also close and are part of COMESA 625 million people. And Africa alone is about 1.4 billion people. That is serious uh, provision of a market for you if you invested here. And Uganda has what we call a liberalized economy where you can come, you can invest, you make your profits. As long as you paid your taxes, you can take uh, your profits away without restriction. What are the investments we have? And I will first generally focus on the ones that I manage in Uganda Life Authority. And on the next slide, I'll just list out what else you could do. We want investors to come and construct and manage high and mid-range lodges in our protected areas. We are currently finalizing the signing of 12 concessions. I'm sure we'll sign them in May because all the processes have been done and we're only waiting for Solicitor General to approve the contracts. We've already submitted these documents to Solicitor General. So 12 will be signed shortly. The moment they are out of the way, we are going to advertise additional ones. So look out. Before the end of May, we should have another set of lodges for investment. If you are interested, look out for them uh, so that we can, uh, you can be able to put in your bid and uh, invest. We want to do a cable car on Renzori Mountains. So that 
those of you who don't have the energy to climb for eight days to reach the snow can go close in probably one hour, two hours and calm down um, and tell the story. But I'm telling you as one who has climbed up there, the best experience is to actually do the walk and climb. Uh, that is the best experience. But there are people who, because of their health, will not manage to go up. They should have a cable car so that they enjoy what those of us with the energy to walk can enjoy. We want people who can undertake feasibility and investment in white water rafting on the Nile, in Maction Falls. We have many falls there uh, that you could do white water rafting on. Uh, a few people have tried it a few times. I think somebody needs now to put in money and invest. We want to construct and manage a canopy walk in Chambura Gorge. Chambura Gorge is the gorge that separates Chambura Wildlife Reserve from Queen Elizabeth uh, National Park. And there are chimpanzees in that gorge. And we want to do a canopy walk as well as part of the experience. We want to do zip lining in the dry crater areas of Queen Elizabeth. Those of you who know Queen Elizabeth, it has many uh, craters, some of them dry, others watered. And um, we want to uh, invest us in that area. We also want to get people to invest in mountaineering products, such as rock climbing, uh, cliff swings, paragliding, especially focusing on Mount Elgon and Mgahinga Gorilla National Parks. Now, in the country are lots of other things. Because you see, if you're looking at a foreigner that is coming, he, she, will need, and here we don't say the other one where I eat. Eh? No, it is she or he. Uh, he, she, if he's a foreigner, will come and arrive at Entebbe Airport. Or when the, the presence directive has been done, probably in one of the parks. They will need transport to take them from the airport to accommodation, wherever it is. So there is that operation of transport and real as a tour operator, you should be able to handle that. And then there is the accommodation, the hotels all over the country. Those are required. And then uh, there are souvenirs and related products that people want to say, I was in Uganda, I want to carry this away. And then, you know, here we are meeting, it's an expo, but there is opportunity for the thing they call mice. Originally, I thought it was an animal, but I'm told it is meetings, incentives, conferences, and events. So, we don't have enough of those in Uganda. We don't have enough of those. Actually, if you wanted the conference and you wanted to take it to Mbari, and you're looking at 500 people, one, you'll not have the accommodation, but two, there will be no room. Even in Kampala here, if you are hosting 1,000 people, that will be a challenge because just getting them accommodation in a nearby place is a challenge. So there is opportunity to uh, provide hotels, conference rooms for people who want to come here for conferences. And um, so, and, and then related things, food processing, uh, agriculture, livestock, manufacturing, because all those things will feed into the tourism industry, and uh, those are all potential investment opportunities. If you are going to invest with us in Uganda Life Authority, what do we do? We normally send out an invitation for bids. When the bids come, we evaluate them. When we have finished the evaluation, if there is need for negotiation, we negotiate. And then we write the contract based on what we have agreed. 
Uh, the contracts are depending on the the investment will normally be between 10 and 20 years but they are negotiable the fees structure is agreed on and uh, financial terms and all those things that are in contracts are agreed on a key issue is that you will need to ensure that the work you do in that investment has as limited negative impacts as possible so we'll expect that you'll do an environment and social impact assessment you want to find out where we are that is where we are uh, i hope i have given you a brief background uh, staff of uganda wildlife authority wherever you are stand up Those ladies and gentlemen can give you more information because you, not, you might not be able to see me or all of you, but if you, are, you want information about investment, please meet them, especially this gentleman called Paul Nisema. He's the head of the group. Stand up again. That, that one is the head of that group. See him if you have further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, E.D. Uh, Sam, can we give Sam another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? I, I, I thank you for your presentation and uh, do expect some questions in case they are. If you have, uh, just uh, note them down. We will have a Q&A session after all the presentations so that uh, we are able to uh, get feedback. Um, on areas where you have some concerns uh, and, and, and Susan while you are away I was, I was telling the team I'm jealous of you you have a very strategic location in Lake Mburu that is very attractive um, anyone going to Lake Mburu and you're taken um, to this location you get to see quite uh, the expansive nature of the park part of the park, the park. and uh, I can't wait to see an investment on that location Susan so I am looking, I am looking forward uh, to that uh, and I will stay there trust me um, the, the other thing is the Uro team that is here in case you really need more information as Sam said the team is available uh, we will leave as many contacts as possible because we believe anybody coming to Uganda should not leave without visiting at least one of the parks um, and if you can't visit the park I th at least go to the education center <laughs> in Entebbe on your way uh, to the airport I want um, to recognize uh, because he sat and I hadn't really officially recognized him uh, Paul Patrick Manja uh, Assistant Commissioner in the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. He's here in, in acting capacity as the PSST or the Permanent Secretary and Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, he will be making a presentation uh, very shortly. So allow me to quickly transition. So Samantha, if you can come and load your presentation um, as I introduce uh, her. Uh, Samantha uh, Munna is a co-founder and Group MD uh, Trianam Hospitality. Uh, she will be speaking to alternative business models, franchise versus management versus hotel lease. Uh, I know Jean Biamugisha from uh, Hotel Owners will be interested in some of the things she's going to say. Uh, and ownership versus ownership, uh, model, the ownership model. So you also want to be mobile, eh? Okay. There you go. All right, Samantha, over to you. Okay. Good morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be back here in Uganda and I was sitting there listening to Edie's presentation on the national parks and I keep saying I have been to two so I still have quite a bit to do um, so each time I come back I have to knock one off um, but it's exciting to see how the tourism offering in Uganda has grown over the years and it's certainly exciting to be a part of it um, and to be able to support um, our brothers um, and sisters here in Uganda in growing tourism investment. Now, um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about in my 28-year career in hospitality and tourism is the indigenization of tourism products. I think when I was a little girl and I, I loved traveling, I had a father who used to travel quite a bit, and so I used to travel with him on holidays, and that's how I fell in love with um, the travel and tourism industry. But in those days, way back when, um, 
one of the things that used to strike me was how our family used to stand out every time we stayed in a tourism facility um, because we were the minorities. So over the years, as we are seeing more indigenous Africans um, embracing travel and tourism, um, not only just working in these establishments, but owning them, investing in them, and helping them grow. This has truly been um, my pleasure, and I continue to serve in this industry and to continue to help us Africans as we invest in this. Now, when I was asked by um, Sophie and the UTB team to speak at this event um, last year, late last year, at the time I was working for Hilton and I was the Director of Business Development for Eastern and Southern Africa, and my role was to grow the number of Hilton properties across the region. So um, my five-year contract came to an end last year, and I rejoined Trianum, which I founded um, a few years back. So let me just take you through this presentation. It's truly just about hotel investments, and that's what I've been working on for the, um, the last decade or so. And then we can always um, jump into question and answers later. So like I said, Trianum Hospitality, um, we're the leading independent hotel operator in East African region. So we do not own any of the properties that we operate. Um, what we do is come alongside investors and help them run their properties. So 12 years we've been in business, and um, our goal is to execute innovative solutions. So we look at each hospitality property that is unique, and we try and find ways to bring that uniqueness to life and try and position it in, in its market. We are a distinctive group of people who anticipate change, we think ahead, and we aim to exceed expectations. And the one thing that we do is we try and make sure that these businesses are profitable. Um, we've to date operated about 18 um, hotels, opened or operated, because um, I'll talk about our services in just a minute. And our vision is just to grow this network of service departments and hotels across East Africa. When I started Trianum, I started it as a consultant. So I used to come alongside and do feasibility studies, investment analysis. And one client challenged me and said, you've written a very good report, but who's going to implement it? And so at that point, I decided to grow the range of services, not just from concept, but to walk the journey with a hotel investor from concept to actualization. These are the services we offer in Trianum. We start off with um, planning services. So you've got a piece of land, you come to us, and we do the feasibility study, we figure out the concept, we do um, the development cost analysis, we can estimate your investment and give you a return, what your estimated return on investment is, and we figure out how you're gonna operate your hotel. So one of the things I always tell owners is start with the end in mind. When you envision this facility that you're gonna put in place, how do you think it's gonna come together? And then we'll help you put the pieces together. It's a jigsaw puzzle. The second phase we offer is technical. At the point you're constructing and developing, yes, you need an architect, a quantity surveyor, engineers, but you also need a hospitality operator who's gonna think through all the operating parameters of the property. And that's where we come alongside um, and we help work those, those out. And because we do a lot of service departments, we've got a special service we call shared ownership services where the apartments are sold to different individuals and put back into a rental pool. So we help manage that. And then as you end your construction, we get into pre-opening services. Those are the last few months after the contractor has finished and you're now putting in everything in place to get the property open. And so we come alongside and we do all the nitty gritty. Um, we call it an OSC budget. Operating supplies and equipment are bought at that time. Staff are hired and trained. IT systems are put in place. And so we help work through that. And we also do the, the physical inspection at the end of construction. And then we open the property to pump and circumstance and have been, um, it's, it's usually my happiest time. I keep saying construction's a bit messy, right? It's all cement and you're wearing construction boots. 
I like the hotel side, you know, once the hotel is open and it's clean and you've got happy staff and they're ready to welcome guests, that's the most exciting time for a hotel. So we open the hotel and we actually do management. Um, our contracts are usually short-term contracts, five years, um, but they can re be renewed after five years. And we take over the headache of running the entire facility. We hire the staff, we train them, we put standard operating procedures in place, we put in your um, financial systems and standards, we handle your taxation, um, we just make sure the place is running and running effectively. So how do we do that? We run it under two types of models. Where you've got your independent property, we're happy to run it independently and say it's operated by Trianum. Or if you want to work with an international hotel brand, We'll work with you, um, we'll take the franchise from the international brand and we can operate the hotel for you. So it's not always that the brand you see on the building is run by that particular entity. Um, I'll come to hotel operating models in a bit and that will give you an idea of the different models that you can work with. So under Trianum we can either do by Trianum or we can do uh, international hotel franchises. Now, I talked about hotel operating models. This is one of the most complex areas when it comes to hotel investment. And I saw in the brief that I was given for today that one of the questions is, how do you simplify it? What's, what's the area where we can find simplification? Now, when you're a nascent industry or your first time entering into this, you think you need to do it all by yourself. So you get into the first model, the first quadrant, which is you're the owner and you're the operator. You put up the facility and you figure out how you're going to run it yourself. You know, you put, um, the, you know, the wife to be at the front desk. You put your daughter to be in the restaurant. You put your son to be the driver come accountant, you know. And that's the owner operator model where everything is totally under your control um, and you're running it yourself. Then you can also get into a lease model where you put up the f uh, facility as the owner, you build it, and like any other commercial office uh, or commercial property, you find a tenant to occupy. That tenant operates the place and gives you um, a fixed rent or a variable rent which is based on a percentage of revenue. So that's the lease model. Um, and these two were the early models when, we, you know, hotel development started at the turn of the last century and they, they were in place right until about the 1960s and 70s. But more and more, we're moving to the bottom two quadrants, which is the HMA, Hotel Management Agreement, or H, uh, the Franchise Agreement, the Hotel Franchise Structure. With the Hotel Management Agreement, which has become the most popular model by the big international brands, is where you're the owner, you build your hotel in accordance to a brand standard you're given by the operator, and the operator is going to sign a management contract. A lot of the international operators have management contracts 20 years or more. So you find a minimum of 20 years. If they're flexible, they might come down to 15 years. Um, in that HMA, you're going to pay them a base management fee, which is a percentage of revenue, and an incentive management fee, which is a percentage of profit, usually tri tied to a huddle. The huddle could be your um, debt repayment, the huddle could be a budget number, or it could be a fixed number that you're looking for a return on investment. So you, the owner, bears the risk for the project and the management company uh, oversees day-to-day -day operations, and that's what we do as Trianum. Then under the hotel franchise structure, you've got an owner who then um, decides to keep the operation, similar to the first quadrant, but because they don't want to have to develop their own distribution systems, they partner with a brand, pick a franchise, and that franchise gives them the whole international distribution and it gives them a brand, but they continue to run it themselves. And if you're familiar with the Best Western brand, this is the structure that they use. Best Western will never come and run your hotel for you. They give you a franchise, you run it yourself, and they actually help you with the distribution. There are very many forms of distribution. So there's the hard brands that we're all familiar with, Hilton, Marriott, you know, Hyatt and the like. But there are also distribution agreements with um, chains like Preferred Hotels of the World um, and with chains like Utel. And they, all they do is put your rooms 
on their portal and they distribute your rooms for you, help you get bookings on a global level um, and channel those bookings to your hotel. So each of these have various different agreements that come into place. Um, you know, many times you will try and go to a lawyer and even the lawyer is learning these um, structures. So we in the hospitality business can help you navigate that, navigate which agreement and which structure works. Is it one structure um, that's fixed all the time? Not necessarily. You can have one hotel that has gone through all these structures because through the life cycle of a hotel, you find these agreements change over time as ownership also changes and as your um, objectives, investment objectives change. So you can move from one structure to another. You can start with a hotel management agreement, then you move to an owner operator model, then go back to a franchise, and again, you know, go back again to an owner operator. So you can move through these agreements, um, but you have to be very careful on termination clauses and the impact of that. So now we've talked about hotel brands, right? Um, the world of hotel brands is vast. It is complex, and we're creating more brands every single day. The key thing when you come to thinking through a brand is you have to ask yourself these five questions. Do I have the hotel experience to run my hotel? And if you don't, then you're going to go out there and look for that experience. When you're looking for the experience, the skills and competence of the team that you're dealing with, you want to understand, um, do they know the type of hotel? Is it a lodge? Is it a beach resort? Is it a business hotel? And what's their skill in that market? Then the market presence. There's a lot of um, talk by the international brands growing their market presence. Africa is the last frontier. You find a lot of these brands that have American, European, and even Asian bases have grown globally and covered the other continents. Africa remains the last frontier to be covered, and there's a lot of focus from the brands on these um, markets. And so um, that's how Hilton partnered with myself um, to get the local knowledge to understand the market dynamics to see how they can grow their brand presence. And it's not just Hilton. You'll find every other brand in the world. Um, if you read travel news, you'll see that these brands are constantly looking to add to their portfolio. But what you have to ask yourself is what's the sales, marketing, and revenue management skill set of the brand because you don't just want the name on the door, you want the ability to be able to drive um, revenue. Then the ability to attract talent. Um, in a market like Nairobi today, it's very difficult to hire the right talent as an independent hotel. So you're finding that the market has reached the inflection point where if you don't have a brand, you will not be able to get the talent that you need to run your hotel. So you find that you know, investors have reached a point where they have to partner with a brand. Um, as a young hotel um, trainee, one of the things I did was make sure that my CV in the first five years only had international brands on it. So that at that point, I could be marketable to any investor. And you'll find many students who come out of college, if you ask them, where do you want to work? They'll tell you, I want to work at Serena. I want to work at, um, you know, Protea. And it's those brands that attract them. So if you're also looking to attract the talent, the branding becomes important. The location of a corporate office or headquarters is also another important factor. You do not want to pick a brand whose office is at the farthest corner of the world and when you need support and when you need intervention, um, you know, they're taking three flights to get to you to be able to help you. But in today's digital world, I think that's um, starting to ease up. However, if you've got a brand that doesn't have a lot of presence in Africa, you will be the one spending all your money to help the brand grow its presence. And so it becomes more costly than if you have a brand that's already present in the market. And then the reputation and the culture of the brand is also very important. You want a brand that has longevity because this relationship, much like marriage or any other long-term relationship, is for 10 to 20 years. So you don't want to get into a brand where the relationship is very antagonistic at the beginning because that's going to be the life of your relationship. And even as the brand executives change, you want to be able to um, make sure that your relationship stands the test of time. So we've talked a lot about brands. Um, you can see the brand world is very, very convoluted. 
the reason hotel companies create brands is they look at the different price points you know from entry level economy hotels to mid market hotels to upscale full service hotels and even into the luxury market and so you look at a market like uganda and you ask so where do we fit into this brand landscape um, you might find your possibly say in the Entebbe market, you're looking at your economy to mid-market because it's a very high transit market for people going to the airport. They just need a night or two. Then you're looking at the Kampala market where it's quite an upscale market. You've got Serena, you've got Sheraton, um, uh, Golden Tulip and the like. So it's very business oriented. You're looking at that upscale segment. Then you go into the leisure markets and you're looking at some high-end luxury brands. And all I've done here is just put some of the big brands up there. But there are other brands as well in the lodging industry. There are brands in the service department industry. So it's very important to take time to understand the world of brands. It is complicated, but we do have the resources to help you wade through and figure out how each brand positions itself. And even as you go through this um, analysis, each company has a variety of brands. Marriott has 30 brands. Accor has 30 brands. Hyatt has about 18 brands. Intercontinental has about 24 brands. Best Western keeps growing. I lose count. Um, they are always adding another company. Wyndham has about 30 brands. Radisson has got um, about eight brands. And there are other companies out there with one or two brands. So the world of brands is immense. It's vast. It's um, one of those complicated things that you have to really think through if you're going to partner with an international brand. But don't get me wrong. You can also build a local brand. That's not my forte to speak today. Um, I'm sure we'll hear a bit more from that from the latitude. You can try and build your own brand and grow your brand from ground up. So when you're navigating this world of brands, what do you think um, you need to do? The first step after you've acquired your parcel of land or you've gotten your concession from UWA is prepare feasibility study. The feasibility study will help you outline supply and demand um, trajectories. It will help you put some numbers to pen and it will help you give you an idea of where you want to position yourself in terms of investment and the returns you're looking so that then you can match the two. Your financial projections are very critical and your return on investment analysis is also very critical too in making that decision. The second step is then now to do the brand selection. So you find a consultant like ourselves and we go out and put together what you call an RFP or a request for proposal. We shortlist maybe about four to six brands we reach out to the brands and we ask them to give us um, their best quote or their best commercial terms. We define those terms or we align the terms against your feasibility study and your performance matrices and that's how we find the best brand, okay? Sometimes you already have a brand in mind and you're very clear that, you know, I want my hotel to be a Protea by Marriott, for example. Um, and so you reach out directly to them. You still need the feasibility study because that's something they're going to request of you and they're going to ask you questions like how much are you willing to spend, where is your financing coming from, and so a feasibility study helps underline all of that. And then once you've selected the brand, then you can now sit down and go to negotiations and start to negotiate the key commercial terms and they're usually about five or six key areas that you have to negotiate. And any time you're looking at a franchise agreement or a HMA, the key areas are always about, you know, like I spoke earlier, your distribution networks, what's the brand bringing to the table. Um, it's not always about the percentage of fees that they're taking, because sometimes they can ask for very low fees and you find they give you nothing in return. So you can negotiate the fees to rock bottom, but when you actually start operating your hotel, you find the distribution network doesn't work for you in that particular location. So you want to be sure that you're actually asking the right questions and you're reviewing the um, agreements that you have um, with, a wide, um, with a wide lens. Many times these brands will give you a draft agreement. And I'll give you a little secret on the brands and what they do. The agreement they put in front of you is their terms working with you. In the agreement, they will never put your terms working with them. That's always omitted. 
you need to be able to get someone who will craft your terms and add them to the agreement. Many times they'll tell you don't change the agreement. Changing it means don't change the wording, but you can add clauses that protect your rights and your interests and that um, put in the language that you need, what you need from the brand. So it's not always cast in stone. The agreement placed in front of you is not just um, the only points that you can discuss. You can actually add in your own points and customize certain clauses to suit your engagement. Now, in a hotel development process, there are many steps. Um, we categorize them into four big steps. I know the wording there is quite small. So the first is always securing a title to the site. And many times I get owners who come and say, I found the perfect parcel of land. Let's build a hotel. That's the first step. Great. We found the piece of land. We've got the concessions from UWA. They've given us the greatest site just at the park entrance. Now, the next thing is how do we move from there? So you want to be able to ensure that the size of land you have, so a topographical survey, any architect will ask for that. Then you do your feasibility study, your market and financial feasibility. Remember the ROI I talked about? It's always important to know how much am I putting into this project and how much do I expect out of it. And then from there, you now get a concept design. It's not the land and then the concept. It's the land, the feasibility, then the concept. The concept design from an architect will always follow the feasibility design. That's how you get the best concept. When you design the hotel first, before you do your feasibility, you will end up having to make adjustments that cost you a lot more down the line. Then from that point, you can select your brand. After you've selected your brand, the next thing you do is now look at your sources of funding. Where is my equity coming from and where is my debt? If I have a million dollars and the hotel is going to cost me $10 million to build, where do I get the other $9 million, right? Is it a commercial bank? Is it a development financial institution? Is it a joint venture partnership? So these are things that are also quite critical in figuring out how these hotels are going to be put up in the lodges. Once you've gotten the funding um, sorted out and you have an idea where you're going to get the funding, then now you go back and you evaluate your project cost. So you remember you've got a concept, you get a QS and they give you an estimated build cost. You go back and look at your projections of income and expense and say, does this build cost make sense? And then you look at your funding and you say, does this make sense? Do not be in a rush to go to ground and break ground. Because if you don't get this right, years down the line, you'll be in debt distress or you'll be in financial distress and you'll be trying to find a workaround solution. Hotels and lodging entities are never built on 100% debt. So you cannot go to the bank and get 100% loan financing. You need to have equity. And in this turbulent market where foreign currency rates you know, are fluctuating, debt has become expensive, the gearing ratio we usually talk about is 50% loan, 50% equity sources. Um, when the markets were more bullish just before COVID in 2015 to 2018, the gearing ratios went up to 80%. But then what happened is when the markets crash, remember your loan amounts do balloon. Um, when you go into distress, your principal payment goes up because of interest um, and delays. So you want to be careful that you also do stress analysis and say, if the market goes south, will I still be able to service my debt or will I lose my facility? Then once the financing part has been done, you then now redesign your concept or you modify your concept in accordance to the brand standards. Then you get um, all your, your detailed analysis. So you get your detailed engineering drawings, you get your detailed interior design drawings, and you get those costed. And then you put them all together so that you understand now what is the full detail of this project. And at that point, once that is done and your funding is now secured, that's when you break ground, you start construction, and at the end of construction, you happily open your hotel. Should you start building your hotel before you've got any of these factors in place, it adds to delays. Delays will always add to your cost of development. So you want to be sure you've done all this part before you get to groundbreaking 
so that then you can build and open your hotel in the shortest time possible. So that's my presentation for this morning. Um, I've put my profile there and we'll be able to share this presentation um, with the team at UTB and you'll be able to contact us. Um, I'm supported by my chief commercial officer, William, who came with me today. And we're happy to take any questions at the end of this presentation. I'll be seated right here, I have my business cards and we can engage further. Thank you. Surely we can do better than that. Another round for Samantha. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. Um, I, I, I notice in this room there is a lot of um, investors in the sector, and um, you know, depending at the different levels, whether it's at the hotel level or the lodge level, please take your seat. It's all right. Um, and and this pre your presentation was critical on, um, especially the areas of interest around growth, growth of a particular. Um, either lodge or a hotel and what they need to do to be able to um, begin planning for the future and uh, I probably have now a better understanding of the ownership model um, and, and also the franchise model that um, a lot of our businesses are beginning to appreciate um, again I probably will ask uh, at some stage, and I noticed you, you mentioned on your presentation, the fact that we, the high-end lodges, especially in the, you know, in the lodges space, uh, are not necessarily involved yet in this market, um, and probably why. And we would need, maybe someone that needs to be targeting those ones, because uh, um, we are maybe attracting good traffic, but we're not attracting high-end traffic. Because if I'm a, I'm a high-end trafficker or, you know, tourist, I'm looking to go to a facility that I already use in another country. So if I'm, if I'm going to Greece and I use this particular facility, I want to be able to go to Uganda and use the same facility. I'm not looking to explore new facilities uh, because I'm not sure. Again, for those of you in the market, uh, the high spenders have particular needs and, and um, evacuation is one of them. I learned that they need to be evacuated in the shortest time possible. So if your facility doesn't have a helipad, they will never come. Uh, or if there's no airport in the, near, in the nearest uh, space uh, around their facility, you may be, not be able to attract that kind of money. So that for me um, is important and, and, and I want to hear what Samantha has to say and why the region is not attracting uh, the high-end business. So the two papers we have, which is one from the Ministry of Finance and the other from NPA, should come later because I'm glad we're listening to uh, the, the real stakeholders in this sector before we bring in um, the government perception uh, and on what government is doing to attract more investment in this space. So let me invite Sven. Um, if anyone doesn't know, uh, Sven has probably the most photographed facility on Instagram in Uganda. Um, I don't think there's anybody who has a good following on Instagram that hasn't been to Latitude and taken a picture there. Please come. Uh, what you want to do from there? Feel free. Uh, I, I can even give you a roving mic, whatever you want. Yeah. What do you prefer? You want to come? Yes, come. Feel free. Uh, we would like to see how tall you are. Uh -huh. Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sven, uh, Group General Manager for Latitude Hotels, Kampala, and we are also present in Malawi and in. Uh, Zambia, Lilongwe, and Lusaka. My subject is localizing a brand, but I'll come back to <laughs> public sector um, and also investment, uh, because we are also looking right now at building five uh, lodges, uh, luxury lodges, which is what you were talking about. Uh, we're looking at building five luxury lodges within the national parks. Uh, in the next uh, 24 months with our American partners who were here recently. And the difficulty we are facing is the public sector is not very responsive and not quick to react uh, to our um, engagement. Uh, I think uh, we're working with uh, PACIED and Audric and Alan who's uh, representing us and we are trying to advance as quickly as possible on that. 
Now, why latitude was brought into this is because our um, brand is quite well known in East Africa. As I said, we have three properties within East Africa and we are developing more. Um, we had to relax a bit during COVID, but now we are looking at uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Nairobi, and Kinshasa, and also Dar over the next uh, three to five years. And most of our investors are coming from uh, around the world, the United States. And recently we have uh, two Ugandan investors who have remained silent and prefer to remain silent, but who are now involved in Latitude in Uganda and will be involved in Latitude and the new, our new um, ventures are going into in the in a few, in, oops, sorry, in the recent, uh, in the next few months. Localizing the brand, now for us it has been, um, as a, our chairman Nick would say, uh, he, when he started Latitude, he was sitting in Malawi, on Lake Malawi in a small hotel that he bought after a long evening of lots of whiskey and decided to buy the uh, island and the uh, hotel or the lodge that he was there. From there he went on and found, as his investment banker, he went off and found quite a few investors from Kenya, from Zambia, from Malawi, from the UK, Singapore, Mauritius, and we have about over 100 shareholders, and decided to create more latitudes. We use latitude as a name brand, as it's easy to position, it's easy to remember, because wherever we can, we can use the latitude of the country. So here we're latitude zero, the equator, latitude 13 is Lilongwe, and Malawi, and latitude 15, which is Lusaka. Localizing the brand demands quite a lot of work or footwork. It's also finding the right area to build, as we have found here in Kampala, although we had some difficulties, and as rightly, we have become probably the most um, Instagram um, hotel in Uganda, and not just on Instagram, but on other social, even on dating sites, you can find the <laughs> pictures of Latitude <laughs> in some of our rooms and other <laughs> facilities. Um, it's been a long, difficult road for us these past three years and trying to create the brand, brand awareness, and making Latitude Zero uh, one of the leading brands in East Africa and hopefully in Uganda very soon. We are a 100% African-based brand, as is Anomo. Uh, Quentin is sitting over there. Uh, he, they're also an African-based um, brand. They started in in uh, Morocco, we started in Sub-Saharan Africa and Malawi. COVID has made it quite difficult for us in, in Kampala, but we have now managed to be, I think we are the best performing, one of the best performing hotels in, in Uganda and Kampala. And that's also due to the style of the hotel, the people who work in our hotel and who also help in uh, branding and localizing our brand to Uganda and to Kampala. Having had two other properties has also helped us with the foreign and international market and the East African market who know latitude because of 13 and 15 that we both have, that we, uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but we have those, and has helped us localize our brand and make latitude one of the best known brands in East Africa and greatly in part to Uganda and the property in Uganda has attracted, has helped us attract quite a number of investors in recent months. Now that COVID is over and we've passed on, moved on to other things. So we have attracted, we are in, in the process of attracting over hundred million USD, including the five uh, lodges that we would like to build. We will not be building them. We will be managing the lodges. Uh, this is American funding. Uh, money from America, and we've also raised for Latitude, we're in the process of raising over 25 million uh, USD and basing our headquarters in Uganda, because Uganda has been very good to us, not the public sector, but, <laughs> but Uganda in general, and the Uganda Hotel Owners Association has also greatly supported us in making uh, Latitude Zero and our brand in Uganda. Uh, one of the places to, to come. And we, we have attracted quite a number of international guests, which has helped us as a brand 
become, and hopefully in the next five years, become the number one African brand uh, in East Africa and hopefully West Africa in the near future. Um, so that's basically my presentation, so <laughs> my discussion. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. That, that was short. All right. Um, I guess that's how you, you get to know if someone has a, the hotel or facility has a great customer care. It has to be immediate. Um, and, and the first 30 seconds are very important when someone enters your facility. Um, you better impress in the first 30, minutes, 30 seconds. If you don't, and the service that they have, someone could just walk away and cancel their booking. Um, so Sven has just done uh, that in about two minutes uh, and, and spoken to localizing um, uh, the business. Um, I'm glad Bonomo is here, uh, and, and that's nice. He, he would be competition, but for you, this is a, a partnership. Uh, for you to recognize that uh, Onomo is here. Um, and that's the problem, maybe the perception we have, that we think we are in competition with each other, and yet we are all selling one brand called Uganda. Um, and, and we need to look around that. Um, and let me quickly check, and I know we will have a presentation from NPA online, uh, but I want to move to Paul Patrick Manja. Um, uh, I think, Paul, the best part was that you had to listen to both Samantha and then Sven, of course. Um, and you're going to speak to the public sector uh, investment incentives as, 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 a, as a country. Uh, but as acting commissioner, he actually sits on uh, the space we're actually discussing, infrastructure um, and, and in the services sector. And so it would be nice to come and you know hear from you because... Um, a lot of people in this room, and Sven has spoken to it, the bureaucracy in the system, um, sometimes even the, uh, the lack of the necessary policies that support the investment uh, protocols that uh, we are looking uh, to, to invest in. When someone is speaking, and some of the things they want to do, for example, the zip lining, um, the, the, the cable car. we should be thinking but most of the other areas you don't have are not under your portfolio but i have seen for example there is a beautiful hill oh, no i think it's even a rock if you're on uh, the kamwenge road from Iba, from barara to kamwenge uh, or to, to fort portal if you're on that road there is a, a particular rock i think it's a very nice beautiful rock that i think uh, people would love to climb but is, it would be difficult, but a cable car would be good, an exciting one to, to take up and go up. And when you're up, you should be able to see uh, the Chibale National Park. I think it's somewhere um, in Iban. Anyway, uh, that's, that's me just dreaming, but it's okay. Um, so, Paul, please come um, and run us through what the ministry is doing, how you're supporting the sector, and how we can reduce the, the, the red tape um, that would allow for investors like Sven um, to come and bring more money into the region. I, I can give you this mic if you want, you, you know. This, the private sector people like to do things differently. So for you, I'll leave it. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mgisha. Um, Honorable Dr. Crispus Kionga, uh, the Honorable Chair of the U Uganda Tourism Board, uh, Mr. Daudi Migereko. The Vice Chairperson of the UTB Board. Uh, members of the UTB Board present. Colleagues uh, from the Ministry of Tourism and Minister of Finance. Uh, the management of UTB the two operators and the private sector present, distinguished uh, participants, fellow panelists. Uh, my name is Paul Mwanja, and uh, I have been delegated to uh, represent the PSST in this forum. Uh, the PSST was unable to, to attend. Uh, he was uh, called to a meeting to discuss uh, the rationalization of government agencies 
and therefore could not uh, make it. So I will uh, proceed and uh, present his remarks as, 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 uh, as prepared. Let me start uh, by taking this uh, honor to thank uh, the organizers of this year's seventh annual Pearl of Africa Tourism Expo, whose success is a clear manifestation of what constitutes partnership, what constructive partnerships between public, uh, private, and development partners can achieve for tourism development. I also want to take this opportunity to offer a warm welcome to all uh, our visitors to Uganda, which, as we all know, uh, is the pearl of Africa. I am happy to participate in this discussion on what government has to offer uh, for tourism development uh, this discussion is important because uh, uh, tourism offers great opportunities for sustainable development. And in this regard, government has identified tourism among the priority areas of focus in the third national development program plan. And this is due to its impact uh, on foreign exchange earnings, as uh, the executive director pointed out, the job creation, uh, poverty alleviation, and uh, environmental conservation, as was rightly highlighted uh, by the UI executive di director uh, through the sharing of resources uh, from parks uh, with uh, the communities. Uh, they are in. The National Development Plan therefore sets clear targets uh, to be achieved by interventions in tourism, and these include the following. One, we have expectations that annual tourism revenues will increase from USD 1.6 billion uh, that, that was recorded uh, pre-COVID to $3 billion. We also expect that the contribution of tourism to employment will increase with jobs increasing from $667 million to 1.1 million people. We also expect increase in inbound tourism revenues per visitor uh, from the current 1,036 US dollars to 1,500. We also expect to have an increase in the number of international tourist arrivals from the US, Europe, China from the current 210,000 to 500,000 tourists. There is sufficient evidence to show that these targets can be achieved. And this is because in the recent past, tourism has played a critical role in Uganda's development agenda. For example, the tourism sector enjoyed consistent growth in the last decade, averaging 5.7% per annum with tourist arrivals increasing from 946,000 in 2010 to 1.54 million tourists in 2019. At the same time, between 2012 and 2020, the contribution of the tourism sector to GDP grew from Uganda shillings 5.2 trillion in 2012 to a peak of 8.4 trillion in 2018 before declining to 7.4 trillion in 2019 and 2.9 trillion in 2020, 
on account of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also saw a growth in export earnings from US dollars 830 million in 2012 to a peak of 1.5 billion in 2017. And between 2012 and 2020, tourism contributed on average 18.52% per annum to the total value of exports from the Ugandan economy. As uh, the ED Uganda Wildlife Authority uh, mentioned, there are evident signs uh, that tourism is on a recovery trajectory. And from the fiscal perspective, we note that in 2022, uh, the non-tax revenue collections by uh, the Uganda Wild Authority, Wildlife Authority uh, who, who work UHTTI and museums grew by 70.2%. This is evidence of positive recovery and it's our expectation that this performance will be surpassed in 2023 due to increased numbers of tourists in the country. In order to support recovery, and sustain growth of the tourism industry, government has focused on four broad areas of intervention. And these include, one, the need for harmonized and consistent branding of Uganda as a, a premium tourist destination. And here I want to thank His Excellency the President and the Honorable Minister of Tourism for the able leadership in guiding the Ministry of Tourism and the Uganda Tourism Board on the recent launch of Uganda's brand identity. The second area of focus has been in upgrading hospitality training facilities to meet global standards and to provide a critical mass of highly trained, skilled labor force for the tourism sector across the region. The third area of focus is facilitating tourism product development to attract more premium tourists and increase tourist spending in the country. The fourth area is the need for tax and non-tax incentives to support uh, private investment in the industry. Let me therefore turn to the issue of tax incentives that are available to investors uh, within the country. In the case of tax incentives, you may recall that government negotiated a number of exemptions from the taxes under the fifth schedule of the East African Community Customs Management Act of 2004. These incentives are expected to drive growth and investments in the tourism industry. The incentive regime is structurally embedded in the country's tax laws, which make them non-discriminatory and accessible to both domestic and foreign investment, depending on the sector and level of investment. I also wish to note that the government undertakes annual reviews of these incentives to make the investment climate more attractive for potential investors. So under category one, the following items are exempted from all taxes under the fifth schedule of the ESC Customs Management Act 2004. One, uh, tourist vehicles imported to the country, uh, gym gymnastic equipment, washing machines, kitchenware, cookers, fridges and freezer, 
and freezers, sightseeing buses, overland trucks, tourism boats, air conditioning systems, cutlery, televisions, carpets, furniture, linen and curtain linen, security gadgets for public space uh, places such as CCTV cameras, motor vehicles for racing and rally, and specialized equipment for development and generation of solar and wind energy. Under category two, there is zero import duty for cold rooms. Under category three, there is an indefinite income tax exemption for aircraft operators, which include all persons engaged in air transport for domestic and international traffic or aircraft leasing. Under category four, there is no VAT on the supply of feasibility study, design, and construction services. There is also nil stamp duty on the bencher, further charge lease of land, increase in share capital, and, and so on. In regard to the non-tax incentives, there are a number of interventions uh, that government has put in place to support the tourism industry. One of which is patient capital and working capital facilities at the Uganda Development Bank that have afforded players in the tourism industry cheap credit. We also have tourism funding facilities from government partners like the UNDP, AFD, and USAID. The other area of non-tax incentive that I would like to, to talk about is the direct investment by government in, in tourism research, product enhancement, marketing, and direct government of Uganda budgeting and loans such as the, the CEDEP that is currently in going, ongoing. In this regard, the budget for financial year 2023-24 for the tourism development program has improved from the current levels of 197.2 billion shillings to 214.2 billion. The key focus in this increment is the need for product development where the development budget of the Ministry of Tourism has increased from the current 11 billion shillings to 52 billion shillings, with specific emphasis on the following projects. One, the Mount Renzori Tourism Infrastructure Development Project that I trust will handle uh, the cable cars uh, that the executive director spoke about. The second area of product development will relate to museums and heritage sites for cultural tourism. The third area will be the development of the source of the Nile, uh, the second phase of that project. We will, we will also help the Uganda Wildlife Authority in mitigating human wildlife conflict uh, within uh, the parks. In addition, over the past few years, the Uganda tourism budget has increased from 17 billion in financial year 2021-2022 to a budget of 20 of 27.3 billion. This budget has been maintained next financial year and will consolidate the efforts uh, designed to rebranding and promoting the Explorer Uganda brand, among others. Key to note is that outside the tourism sector, there are a number of interventions that are supportive to the tourism industry. 
This, these include the continued development of tourism roads, where a number of roads have been completed, including the Masindi Park Junction Road, the Chenjojo Kigumba Road, the Soroti Moroto Lotichanyala Road. While there are more roads are still undergoing construction, and these include the Muyembe Nakapiri Pit Road, Kapchora Swam Road. In addition, government has also planned for the construction of the following tourism roads. Kavale Bunyonyi Road, the contract has been signed. Kisoro Mugahinga Road, the contract was recently signed. The Kisoro Kuringomuko Road, contract is at negotiation stage. The Muko Katuna Road is currently undergoing appraisal for financing. The Kitugum Kidepo Road, the contract was recently signed. The, Mag the Namaguba Budadiri Road is under procurement. The Kasese Kirembe Road under design. And the Atia Kitugum Road is also under design. Another area where government is undertaking interventions is the air transport subsector, where Kavale International Airport is to be completed next financial year and is currently starting at 91% of fiscal progress. In addition, the Ministry of Works and, and Transport is undertaking feasibility studies for the upgrade of a number of airfields. And these include Arua, Kidepo, Kisoro, and Pakuba. All these aerodromes will serve the tourism circuit. In the energy sector, you're all aware that the 600 megawatt Karuma hydropower plant will soon be commissioned and is currently undergoing tests test runs. Coupled with impending power sector reforms, it is expected that the tariffs for electricity will gradually reduce to the government target of five cents per kilowatt hour. I also wish to draw your attention uh, interventions in the internet connect connectivity where government is now undertaking last mile connectivity to the national backbone. In conclusion, to support the realization of the third national development plan results, the government is committed to supporting interventions under the tourism development program of the NDP3, both tax and non-tax incentives will be provided to the industry players. However, there is need for the players along the tourism value chain to organize themselves and acquire the required skills and the required documentation to, assess the, to, to access the support. We shall equally ensure strong institutional partnerships and local governments in partnerships with the private sector. We also expect a holistic master plan for the tourism industry to consolidate 
all efforts in tourism planning, promotion, development, and financing. I wish to thank you all uh, for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, that was for uh, Paul Patrick, uh, but then the another round of applause now should be for the office, the PSST's office that uh, made this presentation. Um, I, I think we need to, first of all, and, and Bradford, you will agree with me since uh, you're the, the, the boss here right now, um, I don't, since Lily is not here. Um, you, you will agree with me that there has been uh, goodwill now from government, especially to the tourism uh, uh, sector, which is now a program, uh, tourism development, and and I'm, I'm I was surprised. Paul wanted to use the 2020-21 numbers versus 2021-22. Uh, Paul, if you had used 2010, uh, it, it would have shown the real progress we have made. And I think uh, I don't know what the numbers were, but I think 2010, um, the tourism uh, sector was probably taking about. I don't know, uh, some were you in the sector already? But I think it was probably uh, under a million dollars. Uh, it was very little money. Uh, I don't know if you have that number, Paul. And now to have moved and maintained the 27 uh, that you've received, uh, that is already budgeted for, for 23, 24, is, is progress made to support uh, uh, tourism and, and the marketing of, of brand Uganda across the world. Um, interestingly, uh, what Paul and the team at the ministry have been saying is that their support to the other s programs, we are now in a program-based budgeting, or pro program-based budgeting, their support to other programs like uh, infrastructure, security, is all geared towards tourism. That, so when you look at the budget going to tourism, don't, don't say that that's the only money government is putting in tourism. That when they build the, the roads, they are supporting tourism. When they build the uh, internet uh, fiber, that is going to support tourism. That when they um, support Uganda Airlines and, and whatever money goes into Uganda Airlines, that is also under tourism. So if we looked at the holistic budget support for tourism, uh, that would be a lot of money. So allow me quickly move to our last presentation. Ronald, uh, I want to know that you can hear us. Ronald, can you hear us? Okay, I think Ronald has, hasn't heard us yet. Uh, Ronald, if you can hear us, say hello. Okay, clearly, let's let's work on that. He can't hear us on the other end, and so he he can't react to us. Um, Ronald Kagwa is from the NPA. Um, he's representing the executive director. He's the director of planning, policy, and information uh, at NPA. As soon as we have Ronald, can you hear us? You're able to hear us. Okay, not yet. So, I'm open to questions. So we have uh, Samantha, Sam, I, I see that that was quick, uh, Sven and, and Paul, uh, as soon as I have... Ronald Kagwa, can you hear us? Okay, I think now he can hear us, now we can't hear him. So let's resolve that. Ronald, now I see you can hear us, but I, I, I'm not sure we can hear you here, because we don't have your sound. All right, Ronald, you want to greet us? Okay, we'll sort that. Let's begin with the questions here. I, I saw a hand here. Any other? I need to just identify where the questions are. My South African sister. Uh huh. Any other? So I know where I will take my microphones. I'll, I'll begin here. Keep it short, introduce yourself. Keep it short and uh, specify who you want your question to go to. Thank you, all the panelists. I am Mukundani Albert, an independent researcher. I am in dilemma. This question goes to the heavyweight in the world life. <laughs> I'm in a dilemma. Where is your territory? Because at time or your space in regards to world life, where, let's say, the migratory birds, the calori, in the calori gardens. They are moving within the city. So, how do we make that demarcation? Two, 
a lot of money, especially the hoteliers, have spent money in clearing the sea flies around Entebbe Airport, around the hotels in Entebbe. How do we control these two things within? Should we make, and the wildlife authorities or the wildlife sector is also losing money in sense of tax, should we have a course of virtual wildlife within the city? Where is the demarcation? Thank you. Should we allow this order to become the order? Thank you. All right. It's on. It's on. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Amanda. Um, I'm a key account manager for all the airlines in Cape Town, um, AXA, so airport company South Africa. I am very much with my chairperson here um, of the ATB board. Uh, he's the one that brought us together and made sure that we are here today. So I just wanted to ask one question. So I've come through the airports, it's my first time in Uganda, and for me, one of the biggest things that I love about where we are talking about accessibility, it's number one, uh, about understanding what it is that our passengers have been to face, number one. So it's about how do we make sure that in every part of our industry that we train the right people with the right skills and we make sure that they understand what it is that we stand for. So that's the first part. The second part is about facilitating an understanding of what it is that we are trying to create, especially when we talk about accessibility and understanding about the African continent. How do we understand that? Because when, I'm just gonna share one element. So as a person that comes from South Africa, how do I understand that when I come to Uganda for the first time, what is it that I need to know, number one. And when I go through the airports, as much as the challenges are the same, but what is it that I need to understand? And how if, is everyone in that same sectors? So from customs to visas, to me getting uh, a travel agency, to me getting somebody that gets me here, uh, the transfers, uh, it took me 19 hours to get here. Can I explain why? Because at some point the transfer company couldn't understand the fact that I needed to get to Munyonyo to go to a conference, right? But I was in Kenya Airways and I was needing to go through certain airlines and at certain times. But at certain points I couldn't understand where I needed to be at certain times. So customer service, how do we train our staff at airlines, at uh, airports, at different hospitality industries? I, I understand that the fact that we've got also understanding of there are different elements that we have in parts of culture. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, when I got to Uganda, the most important thing that I can always say is the humility of staff. Humility of staff is the most important thing. And it's never been something I've seen ever in any way I've traveled. And it is the one thing that you sell. So how do you sell it? How do you sell the fact that you've got the customer service, you've got the people, but how do you empower them to continue to do the journey that you want them to do for everybody here? Okay. I've told, I spoke yesterday to Uganda Airlines and I asked them why you're not flying to Cape Town. There are certain things that they want to um, do in, in order for them to come to Cape Town. Teach us as Cape Town, how do you empower us as Cape Town to be able to take the same humility that you do in Uganda to help me in Cape Town to deliver the same service? All right. How do I do that? Okay, excellent. Um, humility. How, how do you trans export humility? That's a good one. Okay. Uh, Samantha, you had a question. I, I raised a question, and a lot of people agree with me. You need to speak to that question, and some you have a question. Feel free to use those microphones. Um, Sven, I think she speaks to something that also speaks to your area of expertise. 
uh, training, uh, the issue of you know um, training. Uh, uh, Liazi was here, uh, and yesterday he was moderating the panel on connectivity, which is another issue um, that is being raised. Um, so feel free. I'll begin with you, Samantha. You want to start this, and then the big man in the room. They said is Sam. He's, Sam can speak uh, after that. Go ahead. You can pull it closer to yourself. Okay. Um, I think I'll speak to the training element. Um, one of the things that I think we um, assume is that when you hire straight out of um, college or hotel school or aviation school, that the person you're hiring is trained enough to do your job. I think what we need to continue to emphasize is as employers, we also need to do continuous training, continuous on-the-job training, and to help uh, simulate some of the scenarios, simulate an experience for your employees for a first-time visitor as opposed to a repeat visitor, and what that first-time visitor goes through and what experiences or expectations they need to have, um, so that then there's ability to be able to guide that first-time visitor um, through the airport, through customs, Hello. through immigration. Um, sorry? Hello? We've got the Hello. sound down, not the image. Hello? Ronald, now we can hear you. Ronald, now we can hear you. So if you could pause it there, I'll come to you. I can hear you, Ronald. Can we mute it on that side? Now we can hear him, at least we know we can. Can he hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Ronald. All right. Excellent. It's not very clear. OK, well, let's, let's sort it, and I'll, I'll come to you. All right, I'll come to you. Don't worry. I'll let you know when you're, 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 you're presenting, Ronald, and then we'll come to you. Samantha? So while speaking to um, the simulation exercises, you know, training is not just about the book um, and the procedures and the big files you're given to understand the do's and do nots. It's also the experience. So simulate these experiences for your own team so that they can understand. Um, cross exposure, take your team to Cape Town so that they can also understand what it feels like being a first time visitor in Cape Town. So that cross exposure is also quite critical so that the team team can understand um, what the other person across the room goes through. And sometimes, um, and, and I'm not saying this negatively, but sometimes you have to dumb it down and bring it to the most basic level. I'll give you a very practical example. In our hotels this year, we decided to really emphasize on quoting all our rates in foreign currency and receiving it in local currency. That exercise took three months to train the receptionists who are not used to interacting with foreign currency, just for them to understand the exchange rate, buy rate versus sell rate versus mean rate. But when you're a traveler, this is something that you sort of do on the back of your mind, you know? But when you're an employee, you're straight out of hotel school, you probably are just running your first bank account in local currency, you really don't understand what it means in the currency exchange and you know when the rate's up and when the rate's down. So you have to go to that granular detail of training to don't assume that everyone's on the same page. Dumb it down so that everyone can understand and then simulate the experience that you're talking about so that then you know the people on the other end can get it. Then lastly is I guess signage, you know. Um, we take for granted the signage um, that's needed to find your way through an international airport. And I think that's something that's um, quite understated in a lot of African airports. It's just the right signage, you know, ways arrivals, ways departure. If the gate moves, you know, where do you put that signage? Fill the form, you know, stand here, take this form, fill it produce your health uh, yellow fever card at this station, move to the next station, produce your passport. So these are things that when you work in the airport, you take it for granted because you see it every day. But for a first time visitor, they can be very daunting. So I think training, signage, and simulation is so important to be able to get that first visitor experience um, up to international standards. Thank you, Albert, and uh, the whole team here for the question. I'm trying to 
I think I understood the first part of your question. The second, I think I got com confused a bit, but I hope I can uh, respond appropriately. You were asking where is your space, uh, and I understand this is in regard to wildlife. And uh, I've just pulled out the Uganda Wildlife Act, and I've looked at uh, Section 1, and the purpose of the Act is A, the conservation of wildlife throughout Uganda, so that the abundance and diversity of their species are maintained at optimal levels and so on and so forth. And then the sustainable management of wildlife conservation areas. And there are many others. They actually go up to ABC, up to H. And then uh, the ownership of the wildlife um, and wild plants existing in wildlife habitat in Uganda is vested in the government on behalf of and for the benefit of the people of Uganda. And um, so, just wanted to bring those out as I respond to your question, where is your space? The key space is the wildlife protected areas that are gazetted. 10 national parks, 12 wildlife reserves, uh, five community wildlife areas. Those are clearly, fully the mandates of Uganda Wildlife Authority to manage. But if you have a Kalori, um, the stock that we find in Kampala or anywhere in somebody's garden, that too is wildlife and that too is a responsibility of Uganda Wildlife Authority. But we can't be everywhere. And so we, that's why our mission talks about conserving with the local community and other stakeholders. So we are conserving, we are sustainably managing, we are developing these resources with other stakeholders. And that, if I understood your second part of the question, is why you find people privately managing wildlife, but they do manage wildlife under license from Uganda Wildlife Authority, because then we help them to appreciate their role and how they should manage that wildlife privately. So the space is that all things called wildlife is a responsibility of Uganda Wildlife Authority on behalf of the government and the people of Uganda. And, and so that, that's how we manage them. I think in, on the issue of accessibility and training, I know there is a discussion, and uh, Morris, you might have to ask uh, uh, Bradford to talk into this, but there is a discussion uh, between Uganda Tourism Board and the other players that relates to how people can arrive into Uganda, how the visas can be much easier to, to get, how immigration officers should treat those who are coming in for the first time. I think Bradford could help respond to that. Thank you. Sven, you, you wanted to share something on uh, training? Training is, in our industry, is essential and one of the key factors to the success of any hotel or any industry. Uh, we do, for many reasons, we do our training in-house uh, when it comes to latitude. Uh, but I do find, in general, the, the lack of proper uh, facilities for training in Uganda for our industry, and mostly for the tourism industry, is something that needs to, to be worked on. We have great sources, great resources. We have great people who are all willing to learn, but we do need to focus uh, more on the hospitality training uh, that is lacking for our customer service in general. But we, as a group, uh, work closely. We are starting to work closely with um, different companies, one being uh, Tipsy, which is equivalent to Lobster Inc., which is a South African company. Uh, which is specialized in online training. 
um, but it is it is essential. And Uganda, I mean, I've I've never had any problems at customs uh, in Uganda or coming through immigration, uh, having uh, access to online visas, which is very easy and it's um, quite often very seamless to get through uh, into Uganda uh, as a foreigner. Uh, for me, in general, and most of I've never really had many complaints. Um, about it, and I think Uganda is quite, uh, it's very good at, uh, at help and at letting people into the country and easily accessible to the parks and to everywhere. The roads is a different thing, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to training, I think it's, for the tourism industry, we need to have special facilities or we need to have schools outside of the Jinja or YMCA, and I think the Uganda Hotel Owners Association should uh, also uh, push more of the uh, hotel owners to work on providing those uh, facilities for young Ugandans, which will greatly help the industry, the local industry here, and internationally you will also be able to promote Ugandans to go outside of their outside of the borders. Sven, very quickly, same question I had wanted some other to speak to and before some comes in and, and Ronald stand by, is the, uh, why are we not attracting the luxury lodge, um, uh, the large luxury lodges, um, which will be your competition anyway, but uh, yeah, um, as a country, is, that, is it still our red, red tape or is it just that we haven't built the infrastructure necessary for there's an issue of infrastructure when it comes to, to the parks and access to the parks, and uh, which is one of the biggest issues we're facing. And uh, you know, recently we've been discussing uh, with quite, well, the Honorable who's uh, just absent now, uh, and the public sector, you have to go individually right now, and whether it's UWA, whether it's UTB, whether it's UIA or Ugandan Development Bank, and having a one-stop shop for any investor, whether it's in tourism or in the hospitality, where you, it can be UIA, where you go in and this is what you need, this is what we can do, this is how it works, would make it a lot easier. We're finding difficulties, and I'm very sorry, with UWA to get the concessions, when I spoke to uh, Dorcas in uh, my last meeting with uh, PACID uh, and uh, our potential event investors, I asked for a map of the different parks and the concessions in the parks and the size of the concessions, the, the cost of the concessions, and I received something that, yeah, well, didn't fill those, uh, that criteria, so having to go back to our potential investor in, in America uh, was quite difficult to say, well, you know, these are, there's nothing really there. The information is not given that you need uh, to be able to progress quickly. These projects, you know, we are intending, we had intended to start the projects in early 2024. Uh, this will be a setback. Um, the potential investor should be coming back, wanted to come back in June. I need to visit the, con the possible concessions, but I'm still waiting. Those, so these are the hurdles you, you have. I mean, UTB has been very helpful recently, and, uh, and Audric uh, as well, to push so that we can get these uh, potential uh, luxury lodges built. Uh, the advantage of luxury lodges is it's uh, high spend, low impact. If you take Botswana for as an example, where your average, or even in Zambia, you're looking at two thousand, three thousand dollars a night. That's what we're looking at in these luxury lodges or luxury tented camps, if you prefer, to bring into Uganda is that luxury market, the high spend, which also attracts investors and attracts potential investors when they have the facilities and access to the natural parks which is not always easy as well with the airports, but recently the president has spoken about developing the other airports or the smaller airports, maybe hopefully having a domestic terminal at the airport would also help in uh, accessing the national parks. The objective for us is they come into Entebbe, they can fly out directly to one of the parks and from one park, from whether it's Kadepo, can fly to Merchinson, can fly then to Buwindi, then can fly to 
Queen Elizabeth or wherever, you, however you want to do your circuit. Right now, you always have to come back to Entebbe, then to fly to another park. So it's it's a hassle. Driving can be quite difficult. I mean, I just we just drove from Bowindi to Queen Elizabeth. Um, we got stuck in the mud. Uh, with, <laughs> Spent a few hours, but you know, luckily, I mean, and this is the the investor was there. We were helped by uh, Ugandans who helped us get out, and then actually accompanied us all the way to our lodge, which impressed the the potential investor of the friendliness and helpfulness of everyone. Yeah, the humility she was talking about. Yeah, the, humility uh, she was the, talking. the community will always come come into the support. So Some you're going to have to speak to that. Fortunately for you, Sven, uh, is that. Uh, we can have a meeting, a B2B after this. Eh? So the, the two of you are next to each other. So we've already facilitated this. So Bradford, thank you for making sure they're on the same panel. The, we shall sort this issue, uh, the, the, the concession issue. Yes, Sam. And, and this was from the vice chair, Susan. She insisted. Yes. Sam must speak to this issue. So I'm um, taking orders. Yes. Thank you, Maurice. And um, I think Sven raises a, a very good question. But I wanted to talk about uh, training first, uh, which was the issue you raised earlier. I, I think we've had some training done uh, in terms of hotel operations uh, at the UHTTI, Uganda Hotels uh, Tourism and Training Institute. Uh, the quality has been wanting. The Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities working through uh, support from government uh, is in a process of improving that facility. And if you go there, you'll realize there is some construction going on. Uh, the Kalichuram has been redone. The staffing has been reworked. There is a restructuring. And I know that Minister of Finance has provided the financing. And therefore, we will see that there will be better trainers, there will be better facilities, and hopefully we'll get a better product coming out of there that will then be hired by the hotels. And I think both Suven and, uh, and Samantha here have been clear that yes, you will get somebody who has graduated from a school, you need to train them on site. And so when they get out, the hoteliers will then have to train those on site to ensure that they fit in with the brand uh, that this hotel lodge uh, will be providing. So, but, but they should be the best. And that's what the Minister of Tourism through the UHTTI is handling. Now, for investments, the one-stop center issue that is being talked about, something that I never talked about, is that UWA realized that there are several processes that we go through to get an investor on board. The current 12 uh, concessions we are likely to sign next month have taken a very protracted period to get to where they are. And we thought that we needed to shorten that process. So. We have two ways in which we'll handle all concessions. One, the normal advert that we put out in the papers and uh, we, we, we ask people to bring bids and then they bring the bids and we evaluate them. That's the long process, probably taking a year to conclude. Then we have the shorter one and that one will be selective. Uh, a company like Latitude actually fits in the shorter one uh, because we're looking at brands. You have a brand, you're interested in investing in Uganda. We work now directly with Uganda Investment Authority. You choose your site. We don't choose for you. you but we allow you to go and look out. You choose the site you want. And when you've chosen the site, you tell us what you want to do there. We sit together, we negotiate, we don't tell you how much. Because really, you are the professional in this business. So tell us how much you want to invest there, how much you want to pay. We sit around the table, 
we negotiate, we agree terms, we sign a contract, we think that should not take more than six, six months. So that is the other process. But that is only if you are a brand. And a brand we will be sure will deliver. We have about seven or so contracts we signed over five years ago with investors ah, okay. who, are not, with brands. who okay. are not brands. Okay. They have failed to put the first brick. And we are fighting them. And they, are, they give all kinds of funny reasons. So somebody, for example, uh, tells you, you know, I want the road made. He hasn't worked on the EIA. He has no design approved, but wants you to do the road before these things are ready. For example, uh, the others who say COVID killed us, but they've had this agreement longer than five years before COVID, but they're saying COVID is the problem. So we, right. we need to find ways in which we get people who are serious and are ready to invest. All right. One of them is right, right next to you. So we are, we are working. We are, I'm glad you have said this selective option. Uh, uh, Sven, yes. Sven, thank you. just resolved your issue. So there's, there's that. <laughs> yes, that does. Thank you. Excellent. Samantha, quickly, I want to invite Ronald. Yes? On the issue of, oh, you think it was answered? Oh, perfect. All right. So, Ronald, I want to come to you. Ronald, you're between us and lunch, and just in case there is another question. Um, so, Ronald is uh, the Director for uh, Planning Policy and Information at the National Planning Authority, uh, but with us here, he will be the Acting Executive Director, NPA. Uh, Ronald is uh, speaking to sustainable financing options for the tourism business value chain. Uh, Ronald, over to you. Uh, five minutes. No, he gets a late feedback, so I am buying time. Do, do, has Ronald picked our question? Ronald? I, I, I know the technical team have made sure he can, he can be able to hear us, but we need to let him know that... Uh, Ronald, can you now hear? All right. Um, I'm, uh, let me get the team to, to resolve. No. Yes, Ronald. Over to you. Sir. Over to you. Yes. I'm calling, but I can hardly hear you. All right. If, uh, at least we'll send you a text. I'm going to ask the team to send you a message. Five minutes. Over to you for the next five minutes. We can hear you loud and clear. I'm trying to get in, but I can hardly hear you. So. Tim, can we? So, Ronald, yes, we were speaking to the issue of sustainable financing options, um, and you're the custodians of our development plan. I have no idea what you said. All right. Uh, let me get the team to text that to you. Okay. Um, so. Is there a quick question as I buy time for uh, the, the team? Um, Ronald, we're also trying to get feedback sent to you through another Zoom link uh, so you can be able to hear us. I don't know if that is... All right, okay. Let's work on that. Quick question so that I'm able... But Bradford, you had a question. You had actually... Um, uh, I think... Yes, I am able to hear you. But the team... So let's find a way of quickly putting it on the chat. Sam, you had wanted Bradford to speak to what they're doing on the one, on the, on the, on the yes. The, what UTB, NIRA, Customs, um, Foreign Affairs are doing to try and provide the single visa, but also fast track the process of um, registering for a visa online and being able to attract as many people online. What you're doing with UTB and the other stakeholders in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I think I would just want to say th this. Uh, before COVID, I think we were doing quite, quite well in terms of uh, visa access. If you may recall, uh, ADB, that's African Development Bank, periodically, every two years, actually, does a study 
on visa access on the continent, Africa. And uh, the last study we, they did before the recent one, we were actually number three on the continent. We were the best, except one or two countries. So we did quite, quite well. Easy to access visa on arrival and even turn around time at the airport. Uganda was quite, quite good, doing very well. Yeah, I think with COVID, a few things change. Uh, automation, IT, and all that, and that brought quite a lot of some challenges, occasionally uh, interruptions, downtime, and all that. Uh, we didn't do quite well as a country. We didn't do quite well as a country. From number three, we were almost number 38. Uh, 38, you know, these are 54 countries on the continent. But I think recently we seem to be moving well on, this, uh, on the trajectory. Uh, I think uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, just uh, sports surveys from uh, the hosted buyers that received recently. I think we are, we are going back really uh, seamless uh, application and processing. And most of them were quite, quite happy with the process. So we, we are glad if they did another study, I think they do it every two years. I think the next study should actually be end of this year or well, next year. I am I am I'm convinced we, we can actually do, I mean, the results would be again in our favor. But that said, of course, uh, as, as a country, we need to always to continuously improve. Uh, as a country, we need to, to uh, be attentive and listen to feedback from, uh, from travelers. And that's why, as UTB, we are also permanently at the airport. We, are, we, are, we have a desk at the airport permanently, at the international airport in Tebo, of course. Uh, but uh, that's not to say that we are not interested to know what is happening at the other, the other border, border, border post. We have quite a number of border, border posts. A lot of our visitors are coming from, uh, you know, from, from the other borders as well. So with the recent presidential directive that should be having uh, information points and uh, you know directions and all that we as UTB uh, definitely we also be there we guided we are guided the ministry as well uh, but we work closely with the CA work closely with immigration we work closely with other key stakeholders so yes some we are we are, we are on the ground uh, it's really in our favor in our interest that uh, we see that uh, the turnaround time visitors access in and out should actually be seamless and should be something that really uh, portrays the country. But still, it is our own, all, all of our responsibilities. Even the travelers, they need to give us feedback. The Ugandans, when you exit, uh, you enter, you need, to, you need to give your feedback and all that. Yes, I think this is what I can say at the moment. Thank you. But uh, Maurice, since I have the mic, can I also fire a question to Sam? Yes, please. Uh, yes, yeah, Sam, uh, uh, let me fire this to you. Uh, often, uh, we, we also want supporters, UTB, uh, they want to say, what are the benefits of the parks that we have? Can we compare the parks, Massachusetts Falls, can we compare with uh, Kidepo, can we compare with, uh, you know? But Morris also made a very good statement that uh, you are a very big landlord, uh, you, you take quite a number of, uh, you know, the size of the country under your protection. So the onus really is on you to show the benefits of some of these parks. Apart from what we see, uh, maybe like uh, from the fiscal point of view, the communities, the communities would want to see really what are these. Some of these parks are in very, very quality areas. Uh, they are in, uh, how would I call it? If you look at, for example, the, uh, the, 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 the parks in, in Karamocha or the conservation areas, uh, Karamoja is 27,000 square kilometers, and out of that, 42% is actually taken by parks. 42, so almost half is taken. So the question then is, uh, if they allow that to be taken by animals, what are the benefits? And yet at the same time, probably you see there are no numbers going to Karamoja. Before COVID, I think uh, Kidepo was carrying uh, quite close to 8,000. And then out of the 8,000, you find maybe 70% are people who enter without payment, yeah, Bradford and all that. 
So the, the, the benefits will then be in the numbers. You grow the numbers, then people enter, they get back to the communities and all that. The same area is also quite, uh, uh, you know, so there are so many districts. The last time we counted, there were nine. I think they may be having another, the 10th one coming soon. Those are 10 districts within the same area. So meaning that there's a lot of competition uh, for some of these areas and all that. But the message really is research, research, research. Or uh, I think uh, maybe uh, we need to also prioritize research in some of these conservancies All right. and make it a, a quite an important activity to, to, be, to, to, to be really prioritized in terms of funding and all that. Thank you. All right. Um, Ronald, I, I, I know you can hear me. At least I've sent you the text, Ronald. So uh, over to you as Sam prepares to answer Bradford's question. Ronald? Okay. Please go ahead, Ronald. Yes, in case uh, you're okay with that. Yes, go ahead, Ronald. I want to recognize the challenge of access to affordable financing to the critical uh, towards mobile changes. Their survival requires access to affordable financing. But what is also important is that this financing must be predictable, predictable and sustainable. Yeah. If you look at the national budget, additionally, tourism and life is the national budget. But reliance on this budget presents challenges. Tourism receives only 0.03% of the national budget. It increased recently to 0.04% of this budget allocation. Yet, in our vision 2040, we project that by 2040, tourism should be contributing $10 billion to the national economy. Now we see a mismatch between social allocation of tourism to the national economy. The contribution of tourism is really high, meaning the high returns by which invested, but the investment is very low. So, government has not strategically invested or mainstream tourism nor its activities. Therefore, what are we saying? We're saying that we need to invest strategy in strategic you know, tourism uh, areas. We need to invest in tourism infrastructure. We need to invest in our various key attractions. Because these investments you know, have high returns. I'll give you an example. If you get one major tourist on holiday, one visitor on oh, leisure, you can generate around $2,000. And if you cons convince him to stay an additional night, his expenditure will increase, his contribution to export to tourism exports will increase by 12%. Meaning that there is a need for uh, 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 um, to explore and to tap into the returns of the sector. Now, why we are saying so? There's been over reliance on the old partners. Like I said, the really world bank. But we note that the old partners are vulnerable to shocks. Shocks that occur in the old pattern countries, like the current geopolitics, jeopardize, you know, returns and uh, uh, and make the industry unsustainable. So, dependence on foreign uh, um, foreign financing makes our industry sustainable. Meaning, therefore, that this nation Uganda must find sustainable financing options. And in this case, I'm looking at the public, the private sector should come out and invest in different chains towards more chains. The areas where government cannot invest, like transport, 
in rural transport is purely a private sector investment. Yes. Of course, uh, we have the Uganda Line, the airport, that is public sector investment. But it's small planes like in other countries in the region. These are, you know, private sector investment. I've seen them writing in the countries such as Botswana, Namibia. We need to borrow such examples where private sector looks at this as an investment and as the uh, uh, um, UTB, we need to ensure standards and quality assurance. Title that the private sector does what it does very, very well. Community tourism could be another way. Public-private partnership, I mentioned this one. We have conservation trusts. How is this performed? The Windy Mugahinga University Funds. The Rhino Fund, how are these performed? And we extend them for the years. The user fees, do they affect willingness to pay for the potential investors? What's the impact of the, these willingness to, to pay? I mean, user fees on tourist arrivals in the country. Issuing of permits, licenses, concessions on tourism, all the key areas. It will not require payment, payment for ecosystem services, which will be very useful for our ecosystem service services, where the beneficiary pays principal your works, where market markets eliminate those who protect our biodiversity. I think as the tourism fraternity, we need to explore the participation in the carbon trading markets as another very important source of money, or has demonstrated the, 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 um, the ability to generate non-tax revenue. I think this should be facilitated. I know UTV can also generate non-tax revenue. So we need to transition to more sustainable financing models. We need transition to more sustainable financing models. And we need appropriate instruments, finance instruments. We need information on the impact of these instruments. And these should uh, uh, you know, inform our policy. And uh, these are uh, very critical. We see the Uganda Economic Bank as a critical avenue for access to affordable finance. We need to make a case for tourism financing to keep policymakers. Yes. Hello? Hello? The right. tourism levy, it only requires regulation and uh, how do we, what examples do we borrow from the regions to say that tourism levy, you know, works for tourism? Uh, last week, chair, grants, subsidized loans, all these. Once they are tailored to the tourism, are very, very, very critical. In direct financing and even the risking, devising risk sharing mechanisms to tourism, because there are some risks which the private sector cannot undertake. So we need to devise risk sharing mechanisms. Chair and uh, colleagues, I think that is what I can say as of now. I thank you very much for listening. I'm very sorry for not following very well because of the network issues. I submit. Thank you very much. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Ronald Kagwa. <laughs> Ronald, thank you. Um, you. You capture the interests of the conversation in this room. Uh, and I know for a fact that uh, government in um, trying to achieve Vision 2040 is already looking at, at, at various financing models to public infrastructure. And I think, uh, especially public investments, um, where government believes what initially used to be its mandate can actually be financed through uh, other models. Um, uh, one of them is one we are benefiting from, all of us, uh, getting out of Entebbe into Kampala in about 30 minutes. 
uh, some people have tried to do it faster, but they don't reach when they, they move faster on that road. So the Entebbe Expressway um, is one of those, which is a PPP, and we are paying a fee to use the facility. It gets into the city quicker than you'd use the normal road, and that was financed through a PPP. And we are looking at other investment options along those lines, especially in the tourism sector. If, for example, some spoke to the cable car to Renzori, that will be quite a pricey project. I, I may not, we may not necessarily, and unless Sven has very good rich friends, we may not necessarily get somebody uh, coming to invest in the project alone. They might want government to come on board as a partner, meaning they might want to bring other stakeholders on board at a price, which means we may have to um, charge a little more to use that facility than it would if government was to invest in it 100%. I like that Ronald's ask, in asking many rhetorical questions was also indirectly giving us some answers. Uh, are we looking at the financing models, the conservation areas some he spoke to? I don't know if you're willing to speak to that. How are they performing? I know, for example, we have um, uh, here it's not trophy hunting, Sven. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just hunting. We have hunting licenses, and I know Sam is giving out hunting licenses in some areas. Um, how is that performing? Do, should we, and do you now have enough animals for us to have trophy hunting, which again is being banned in some areas and, and you know, um, is being spoken against in, in, by some conservationists in, in other areas? Is it a, is it a, a model for financing? Um, the, the sector. So maybe some you'll have most of that. He was really asking a lot of good questions and pro providing areas of interest for us. But I want us to close and I want to begin with Paul Patrick um, who will run us through his takeaways from our conversation on investment. Uh, when I had Ronald and we were already praising you for increasing the budget in finance uh, to tourism but when he, he broke it down to the percentage of the national budget, it became so painful, 0 0.04. I, I think we are not, if we could just get to 1%, we'll be fine. Okay, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Um, the, 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 the number of takeaways uh, from uh, this interaction and uh, uh, from the, the questions uh, that we saw come in, uh, I think there was feedback on the efficiency of our business processes, uh, uh, which is one thing that we need to look into. I think we need to undertake a diagnostic assessment of our processes and uh, think about automation. Uh, there is the issue of uh, improved coordination uh, within government that will also add to the efficiency within our processes. Uh, Samantha did raise the point uh, that if you're undertaking private investments, you need to undertake studies, feasibility studies. I must add uh, that is also true for public uh, sector projects. And uh, what drives allocations uh, within the budget uh, for interventions in any sector is the need to have uh, bankable projects that are backed by studies. And if, if the tourism allocation uh, remains very low, it is probably because they don't have an inventory of bankable projects uh, to, to, to drive uh, the allocations. So they have uh, some work to do. Uh, we want a master plan for the tourism program with an inventory of bankable projects that we can consider uh, financing. Because uh, Ronald has made the important point that the returns on investments in the tourism sector uh, are quite high, but we must be sure uh, that the, 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 the products we are investing in have been well studied and uh, uh, we will uh, bring in uh, those uh, re returns. So those are my takeaways, and I, I, I would like to stop at this. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, uh, Sven. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my takeaway is that uh, Sam is going to respond <laughs> to our request <laughs> very rapidly, which is great. Um, 
and that well, the public sector is getting more involved in trying to facilitate uh, investment in the hotel industry or in the tourism industry easily. Um, I think Samantha, you know Dan very well. He wished he could have come today. He will be very happy to hear what has been happening. Dan is building the Hilton uh, in Kampala, which is a huge investment, uh, and he's a local. He is Ugandan. It's his money, and uh, it will be a great asset for Uganda, and he does need a, a lot of support from the public sector, so I'm very happy for him that uh, the public sector is getting involved and will be able to support more of our initiatives and our investments uh, going forward. Thank you. All right. Um, Sam, you had a question also from Bradford. I hope you remember. I thought I would escape from that one. <laughs> uh, thank you for the reminder. I think the fact that Karamoja is 27,000 uh, square kilometers means it's about 11% of Uganda. Uh, what Bradford did in tell you is what the population of Karamoja is because he wants to hide that one uh, and only say the parks are taking 42%, which actually is not correct. I think we are under 20% uh, in terms of the parks and reserves uh, in, in the area of, of Karamoja. But the population is a sparse. When you get in there and you drive for long distances and there is no park, but there are no people, you would realize that he, the, the, the government is really not necessarily taking the, the, the people's land. I think what we should be looking at, and for Karamoja it's a much bigger issue, is how do we get communities benefit from the resources they have, not only parks, um, because, for example, currently there is a, a lot of work going on uh, picking uh, rocks that are used for cement production, it's coming from Karamoja, uh, I think it's lime or something. Um, there is gold mining happening, there is marble uh, happening, and lots of other things. But how do we get the communities benefit from these resources that are coming from the area? I think that is a broader uh, issue that we need to look into. But specifically for Uganda Wildlife Authority, one, the visitors getting into Kidepo, actually before COVID had gone beyond 20,000, not 8,000, so there were many. And we had already reached a level where we could, in a year, one year, provide over 200 million Uganda shillings to communities that neighbor uh, Kidepo Valley National Park. Now, that is a good thing for Kidepo, but Matheniko and Bokora and even Pianuupe that have less number of visitors were not necessarily benefiting. So we need to look at other means in which we can get them benefit. And you talked sport hunting, trophy hunting, as one of them. Uh, because a trophy hunter will come uh, and kill um, an animal to take the trophy, and then you are able to charge them exorbitantly uh, for that. Now, for Uganda, we look at the population of wildlife we have and I need to be clear about that. So, for example, we don't hunt elephant, we don't hunt lion, we go for buffalo because we have lots of those, we go for Uganda cob, we have lots of those, uh, we look for the ones that we have good numbers and they are the ones that uh, we use for trophy hunting. So we are selective because we want to ensure that our life is protected. So. In terms of how the communities can benefit, revenue sharing is one, employment is another. There are businesses that will come up because uh, you, you have tourism, the food, the souvenirs, the guiding services, transport services. Often those do not necessarily come from Uganda Life Authority, but they come because 
There is a product called a national park where people are coming to visit and then the, those who visit need these services. So that is, is one area. Then there is the whole issue of infrastructure. Uh, currently, what is happening in the country, if you listen to the tourism stakeholders, they're all making a lot of noise about roads around Buindi. Buindi being the uh, major attraction because of the gorillas. Not necessarily because many people go there, but because it is a premium. And uh, I, I liked the Minister of Finance saying they've signed the agreement for, for Kisoro to Mgahinga. Uh, did you say you've signed the one for, for Kisoro to Nkuringo? Yes, Muko? Yes, Already signed? I, I, I am sure the tourism fraternity will be excited about that. And I hope the mobilization time won't be a year. I, will, I hope they mobilize in three months and start working on the road. First, to make it uh, motorable, and then work on the, the rest. And, and I also liked the Kidepo one, because going to Kidepo, Kitugum Kidepo is, uh, is really very bad these days. So that, 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 that infrastructure, and I wanted to end with the Kitugum Kidepo, that infrastructure, it's not coming because government just wants to put a road there. It's because there is a park in your area, sir. And, and you should be grateful that the park is there because it is attracting infrastructure. Uh, and then for people like Bradford himself, he can invest. Yes. So we, we encourage you to come and invest. No, I am not allowed to invest in a park. You are allowed to invest in a park. Just say you don't have the money. So. <laughs> Come and do he, a partnership he with can, my yeah, neighbor. He here. can partner with Sven. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Equity um, partner. Then, then finally, the tourism sector is, uh, I think, a big, a big player in the economy of this country. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about getting a visitor into the country and going to see an elephant. There are lots of services from Entebbe all the way, whether they are flying or they are going by road, they will need that transport, they will need the accommodation, they will need the souvenir. And uh, we've had tourists who have even decided that Uganda is the best country to stay in, and they've decided not to go back and have come and invested. And so we just need to remember that and as Ugandans allow the investment climate to be easy, uh, let each one of us play their role appropriately so that we can get those resources coming. Because you see, as a Ugandan, if I invested in tourism, my, the people I will look for are Morris and uh, you Ugandans in this room. But if Suven comes, he will bring in a lot more from outside. And if you came to any of my parks, incidentally, uh, foreigners pay up to seven, eight times more than an East African pays for most services, be it gorilla tracking or entry or anything. So that is money that is coming into our economy. And when Uwa becomes rich, it will throw that money back into the staff. It will buy things from the market. And so business will boom. So it is important that all of us uh, realize that tourism is a big thing for our economy. Right. And let's play the roles we each are to supposed to play All right. to ensure that we get more investments into the country. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, finally, Samantha. Very quickly, Samantha. We are between uh, uh, lunch eh, and the next presentation. I need to be careful. Okay, great. So, all my fellow panelists here have talked about the great importance of tourism. And I'll give you a snippet. When we arrived on Tuesday with my colleague William, 
I kept telling him, we have to go to Latitude Hotel. So yesterday morning we woke up and we went to Latitude. The taxi driver we got did not know the place. So, you know, we used Google, got lost a few times. But eventually we found our way there. And the first thing I did was whip out my phone and go look for that spot that I keep seeing, that, you know, Instagram, take a photo here. And I had to do the same thing. So what I'm telling you is that brands, international, regional, and local, all together um, support the marketing of a facility. Why did I need to do this? I've read so much about latitude properties from Lilongwe to Lusaka and now here that I needed to be part of that train. Am I a foreign international tourist coming from America? No, I've been to Uganda many times, but it was my first time to do something different and visit latitude yesterday morning. So. In this room, as we sit here and as we think tourism, don't only think of the, that international visitor who's coming from so far away. It's also we fellow East Africans. It's each other. It's visiting a part of Uganda you've never visited before. It's visiting a part of East Africa you've never visited before. It's supporting each other's businesses. I'm sure you've got a friend who's got a tour operator, another friend who's opened a small hotel somewhere. That's tourism as well. It's not always going to be just the international leisure visitor. And I like um, something Rick Taylor and his team said two days ago, that business travel um, is something that we also need to look into. The two are not mutually exclusive. Business travel and leisure travel all operate in the same vicinity. So as I took my Instagram photo yesterday, there was a business meeting going on right there at Latitude Hotels. So let's make sure that we are not drawing hard lines between business and leisure. The two have become blended. And even as we look at Uganda um, Wildlife Authority's parks, let's also think, how can we bring meetings and conferences to these areas outside the parks, within the vicinity of the parks, so that the people who come for meetings there can add an extra day and go into the national parks and enjoy leisure activities. So thank you for having me here, and we look forward to growing Uganda's tourism together. All right. Um, so, so I want to thank the panel. Surely, let's put our hands together again for the panel. Well done. But, but when you have the CEO of the Africa Tourism Board in the room, you must give him a minute. So, Cuthbert, if you can come, <laughs> uh, Cuthbert, please come and, and speak to um, this issue because it's, it falls in your uh, portfolio. Uh, in a minute, and then you will stay because yourself, Bradford, and uh, Liazi will uh, give our fantastic panel uh, small souvenirs. Thank you so much, colleagues, and thank you so much to our panelists. You are so marvelous. We really appreciate. I mean, the tech homes, I think we have emphasized on harmonization in every sphere of our tourism sector, which is very critical, and also communication, which is the key uh, to enable a seamless experience to the traveler. For example, I was in, um, in, 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 in Rwanda, right? On, on my way coming here, I went to the check-in counter, presented my passport, said, no, 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 no. Uganda, you need to have a COVID certificate. Otherwise, we are not going to let you through. But unfortunately, I did not have my, because all the countries apparently they are no longer, that's not a prerequisite anymore. So we need to be able to communicate so that as a traveler, before you embark on a journey, you know what are the requirements to your destination. And also uh, appreciating your domestic market segments, which has been omitted. So I'm glad that the parks are affording an incentive to your local communities, which is very key. And the plea as well, especially to our establishments, the hotels. I'm not sure the setup here in Uganda, whether the local communities, are we affording them a discounted rate? So that it is less enjoy that fraction that comes in. But over and above, colleagues, let's work to, it's all about synergy, it's all about collaboration, it's all about working together towards the same objectives. Thank you so much. We really appreciate. Let's move on. 
and uh, let's keep the flame burning. Africa, it's your time. We need to make it happen now. Thank you so much. So I'll invite um, the panel to come down. We are going to give you some uh, souvenirs. I'll ask uh, Bradford. Uh, Liazi, please come. Um, you are uh, all going to award uh, each of our panels, so panelists. So please, we, we could begin with the Africa uh, Tourism Board. Uh, he, feel free to, he will give anybody, any of the panelists. You, you begin here. You can give it to, you're giving, give each of them a box because they will award. You, uh, Liazi has said he'll give Samantha. So Samantha, <laughs> Samantha is booked. Uh, okay, uh, Bradford, give Bradford one and give. Uh, okay, so um, Riaz, you can go to the middle and allow Samantha. Samantha, we need to take nice photos. So please, Samantha, go to the middle uh, and, and receive from our director in the Ministry of uh, Tourism and Wildlife. Ah, there you go. We have a photo there. So, yes. Um, there you go. Uh, guys, there's someone also taking. I think Samantha, someone there wanted to take a picture to make sure it's for. Yes. The boss, there's a ca camera at the back there. Um, Bradford, who are you giving? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so bring, bring one for, for Cuthbert. Cuthbert, you need to get, get, get this one. So you're going to award it to Mwanja. Mwanja, you and uh, Cuthbert, please, you're, you're awarding Mwanja. Please go to the middle so that, uh, yes. From uh, UTB to the Ministry of Finance. Thank you very much, Mwanja, for uh, your presentation and representing uh, the PSST. There you go. Um, Aliazi, I think you'll need another one. Aliazi, you can give some also. We want some to... Oh, see, Sven. Yeah, Aliazi, please. Sven. As a ministry, you, 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 you must be happy that Sven is investing and bringing more money into the country. Uh, please give Cuthbert another one. Yeah, he will give uh, some. It is nice uh, some that you're getting one from Cuthbert. All right, um, Cuthbert again in the middle, there for uh, photo op. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. And and the final one I'm told is mine. So Bradford is only giving is mine. Okay, so I will go and receive mine now. <laughs> so we have a group photo with uh, the Africa Tourism Board and uh, the Ministry itself. So feel free uh, to, in any order, um, and 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 this is really to appreciate all our panelists. I, I'll join. The first one is without me. Me, I'm a, the outside enthusiast. Uh, the rest of you are the practitioners in the sector. Um, so this really is to appreciate all of you, our online audience that has been watching the YouTube stream. In case you're with us and you want to watch the entire conversation, uh, please ask for the link. Uh, the UTB team will share with you the link. You can follow the entire conversation. Uh, let me just join this photo. Photographers, don't cut me out, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for our panelists. Um, somebody may not go home because I have your car keys, so you left them somewhere. So, uh, And it looks like a very cool car. I'm happy to just keep checking where it is parked. I just keep pressing the alarm and finding out where it is. Uh, so if you don't have your car keys, let me know. I'll pass them on Every to you. Our next day session is a reminder is a just how beautiful this, our land, truly is. The kind of beauty that you can only find here. In the lush green all around us and the wondrous sights within. It's what you feel in the gentle caress of tropical wind from the mountaintops. And the glow in your heart from a warm neighborly invite. It's in the distinct aroma of our cooking to the taste of food that takes you on a journey. 
the sound of homecoming and the sound of Mother Earth. In the magnificence we find on our travels and the exciting moments we experience. Ours is the kind of beauty that comes in all things big and small. All we have to do is awaken our senses and truly enjoy what's uniquely ours. Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Every waking day is a reminder just how beautiful this, our land, truly is. The kind of beauty that you can only find here. In the lush green all around us and the wondrous sights within. It's what you feel in the gentle caress of tropical wind from the mountain tops. And the glow in your heart from a warm neighborly invite. It's in the distinct aroma of our cooking to the taste of food that takes you on a journey. In the sound of homecoming and the sound of Mother Earth. In the magnificence we find. Welcome to one of Africa's highest, most remote and unknown mountain ranges located in Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. The Renzori Mountains, also known as the Mountains of the Moon, are stretched over 120 kilometers long and 61 kilometers wide. Come and experience Africa's most beautiful alpine area. With every hour and every altitude gain, the landscapes, colors, and views are ever-changing. This UNESCO-protected national park contains unique biodiversity and breathtaking sceneries such as the bamboo zones, mossy heather zone, numerous waterfalls, tropical rainforest, mountain lakes and eternal snow. Culminating at an altitude of 5,109 meters, the Margarita Peak is the highest point in Uganda and the third highest peak of the whole African continent after Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya. This mystical and demanding mountain range is located on the foothills of Queen Elizabeth National Park one of Africa's most popular game drives and a few hundred kilometers from the Bwindi impenetrable forest that inhabits the endangered silverback mountain gorillas. Renzori Mountains offers trails for all levels of hikers which range from one day to 10 day trips. The shorter trips are not as physically demanding and still showcase the amazing beauty in the art of nature, including rare vegetation, rivers, and numerous waterfalls. This unique biosphere is a true gem that needs to be preserved not only for the many endemic species it contains, but also for the local community which directly benefits and lives from the mountain's gifts. Be ready for the ultimate trekking experience. Come and discover Renzori, the mountains of the moon located in Uganda, 
the Pearl of Africa.